Good morning, everyone. We're preparing to begin. Please be seated or stand in position as we prepare to start. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I am Jermaine McKenzie, Development Coordination Officer in the United Nations Resident Coordinator's Office. And on behalf of Dr. Keneal and the United Nations country team, welcome to UN Day 2022. Today we recognize the entry into force of the UN Charter in 1945. This is the 77th year of existence for this, the foremost institution responsible for maintaining international peace and security, for developing, facilitating friendly among nations, and for promoting social progress, better living standards, and human rights. Today we answer the call of Secretary General Guterres to recommit to the spirit of partnership and multilateralism as vehicles for bringing to life the values and principles of the UN Charter here in Jamaica, and in every corner of the world. Today's UN Day is particularly special as we also recognize the 60th anniversary of Jamaica's entry into the United Nations. In its 60 year membership and across governments and administrations, Jamaica has been a consistent champion and advocate for peace, multilateralism, human rights, reduced inequalities, climate action, and equitable development financing for small island developing states. This UN Day is Jamaica's, Jamaica's diamond jubilee and is worth celebrating. For her contribution to this organization, please give a round of applause to our member state, the people and government of Jamaica. Today we commemorate this moment with the key clients of the UN system. The people of Jamaica and its diaspora are present in thousands online, which we've made accessible via YouTube, Facebook, via the platforms of the JIS, the PBCJ, and the UN Jamaica. You may participate virtually with this community by posting in social media and using the handle and hashtag UN Jamaica. Please give a round of applause for our online participants. The UN enjoys a hospitable and cooperative relationship with the government of Jamaica and its partners, many of whom are present today. As I recognize them now, I invite you to make them welcome at the end. Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Mrs. Natalie Nita Garvey, Member of Parliament, representing the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Mark Goulding. The Honorable Leslie Campbell, State Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Head of the Foreign Service, Permanent Secretary, Ambassador Sheila Sealy Monteith, and the staff of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, His Excellency Hugo Verbis, and other members of the Diplomatic Corps and their spouses. Mr. Michael Lodge, Secretary General, International Seabed Authority. Heads of international organizations, please make them welcome. <laughs> Continuing, permit me to also welcome and acknowledge Dr. Wayne Henry, Director General of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, Diane Edwards, President of JAMPRO, Donna Parchment, the Political Ombudswoman of Jamaica, Lieutenant Raphael Salazar, Director of Music, Jamaica Defense Force, Captain Devron Newman, Dean, Caribbean Maritime University, the Caribbean Maritime University Cadet Corps, Warrant Officer Gregory Nicholson, Conductor of the Jamaica Regiment Band, 
members of the press, staff, retirees of the UN agencies, funds and programs, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Give yourselves a hand for being here. To remind us of why we're here, and to bring greetings on behalf of the Secretary General and his UN country team, is the UN Resident Coordinator, Dr. Gary Keneal. Dr. Keneal joined the UN country team in Jamaica after serving as Resident Coordinator in Burundi. Before that, he served as an Under Secretary General with the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. He's served re as Regional Director for UNOPS Africa Region. In the wake of Haiti's 2010 earthquake, Dr. Keneal served as Chief of Staff to the Office of the Special Envoy for Haiti, former U.S. President Bill Clinton, where he helped coordinate Haiti's reconstruction efforts, thereafter serving as Prime Minister of Haiti. Even with this over 20 years of experience in global development leadership, Dr. Keneal himself will first tell you that he is the proud father of twin girls. Ladies and gentlemen, he ensures that the UN in Jamaica coordinates efficiently to deliver as one. Please welcome Dr. Gary Keneal. Thank you so much, Jermaine, for this uh, very generous introduction. As I always tell you, uh, this Dr. Keneal guy looks like someone I would love to meet. But I'm Gary, and I work here in Jamaica for now two years. And um, let me start first, of course, by acknowledging and welcoming Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Mrs. Natalie Nata Garvey, Member of Parliament representing the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Mark Golden, the Honorable Leslie Campbell, State Minister, State Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Ambassador Sheila Sili Monteith, Permanent Secretary, Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. His Excellency Ugo Verbist, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, High Commissioners and Ambassadors and Members of the Diplomatic Corps. Mr. Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority, Members of the United Nations Country Team, Heads of Offices of International Organizations, of course, Dr. Wayne Henry, Director General of the Planning Institute, Donald Parchment, the Political Ombudsman of Jamaica, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First, let me welcome you all to our UN Day and 60th anniversary of flag raising commemorating Jamaica's membership into the United Nations. I bring you greetings on behalf of the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, and the United Nations country team. As resident coordinator, it continues to be a pleasure and an honor to serve the people in the government of Jamaica in this year, its Diamond Jubilee of Independence and UN membership. Excellencies, distinguished guests, our modern world faces some of the greatest challenges in its history. From the climate crisis to COVID-19, from the fallout of the war in Ukraine to growing threats to democracy, now more than ever, the UN, United Nations must remain the space for constructive dialogue and a beacon for sustainable peace, prosperity, and the future of our planet. From the dawn of its independence, Jamaica has championed the idea that many of the world's problems are interconnected and can only be solved through greater solidarity and cooperation. And over the years, Jamaica has proven that even small nations can influence the global agenda not only through new and innovative solutions, but of crucial importance by working with other countries with similar concerns. This was certainly the belief that led Prime Minister Bustamante's government to gain membership to the UN as quickly as possible. Just a few short weeks after that August 6 morning, on a day much like today on September 21st, the black, green, and gold was unfurled at UN headquarters for the first time, affirming Jamaica's commitment to international cooperation and to the rules-based international order with the United Nations at its core. Since then, 
Jamaica has played an outstanding role in the United Nations system, helping to call international attention to such significant matters as human rights, decolonization, economic cooperation and indebtedness, and of course, women's issues. In its 60 years, Jamaican ha Jamaicans have served with distinction in senior United Nations positions and provided exemplary leadership to over 40 organizations, subsidiaries, and bodies of the executive and committee levels of the UN system, unique for a small island development state. And Minister, might I add that your election to one of the three roles of Vice President of the 77th General Assembly speaks to the high regard and respect Jamaica enjoys from all member states. So whether it is championing with success the Declaration of the International Year of Human Rights, the fight against apartheid in South Africa, or helping negotiate the process which ultimately led to Zimbabwe's independence, or working alongside Canada to raise awareness and investments for SIDS, when Jamaica gets involved, things get done. And for that, we are extremely grateful. Excellencies, distinguished guests, as Jamaica continues to lead an ambitious global agenda, the UN partnership in country to accelerate progress towards the SDGs is at its highest level. In the past two years alone, joint programs have increased 400% with investments of the current country implementation plan already exceeding our expectations. United Nations agencies, funds, and programs represented in this room today are working closely with the Planning Institute of Jamaica, line ministries, government agencies, civil society organizations, and multilateral partners to find innovative solutions to Jamaica's long-standing development challenges. Through a more coordinated, coherent, and effective approach, we are seeing positive signs of progress in our joint efforts to strengthen food systems, improve education, build a better future for our youth, protect the environment, address the needs of people living with HIV and AIDS, and stop gender-based violence. This, of course, is cause for enthusiasm and optimis optimism. And at this point, I would like to recognize the many staff you see here, national and international, that work side by side to support the goals of the Jamaican government. And I would like to ask you to really give them a big hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> Still, many challenges remain, and our resolve will be continuously tested. Today, multilateralism is unfortunately met with significant cynicism at a time when more than ever, we need to bring the life values and principles of the UN Charter to bear. And to sustain our progress in some areas and recuperate other recent losses because of COVID, we will need solidarity and more effective cooperation. And nowhere, nowhere will we need it more and more urgently than in our fight against climate crisis. At the global, regional, and local levels, we need to circle back to our common compass, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which is so well aligned to the Jamaica's Vision 2030 for National Development. So as we mark UN Day here in Jamaica, I want to thank all of you in this room for your commitment to the purpose and principles of the UN Charter that had guided us for the past 77 years. And I would like to call on you, as the Secretary General has, to renew our hope and conviction in what humanity can achieve when we work as one in global solidarity. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you, Dr. Keneal. Ladies and gentlemen, indeed, Jamaica's best days are ahead, and this is the belief and mantra of our next and keynote speaker. Her beliefs are matched by her hard work and commitment to playing her part in seeing Jamaica realize its best and highest potential. Following the general elections in September 2020, our keynote speaker was reappointed as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, and leader of government business in the Senate, a position she has held since 2016. 
She is Jamaica's first woman minister of foreign affairs and foreign trade. Our foreign minister has represented Jamaica and the region at the highest levels and continues to reaffirm Jamaica's commitment to multilateralism. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming one of the three vice presidents of the 77th General Assembly of the United Nations, Senator the Honorable Kamina Johnson-Smith, Minister. Thank you so very much for your kind introduction, Jermaine, and I'm going to ask because you have so adeptly ensured that everyone straight through to our retirees have been recognized this morning. I'm gonna ask the audience to join me in applauding you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Dr. Gary Coney, resident coordinator, Mrs. Natalie Nita Garvey, representing leader of the opposition, Senator the Honorable Leslie Campbell, Minister of State in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Ambassador Sheila Seliman Teeth, and the team at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Verbeest, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Secretary General Lodge, heads of international organizations, and in particular, I greet heads of UN agencies present here today. Ladies, one and all, including members of the media, good morning to you and a happy UN Day 2022. The government of Jamaica is pleased to join the international community in observing UN Day. This observance offers the opportunity to join forces in demonstrating the value we place on the worth of the United Nations as we meet these particularly challenging global times. In so doing, we exalt the validity of the purpose and the principles of the UN Charter, which have guided us for 77 years because, yes, even pre-independence. But this year, however, Jamaica celebrates the dual commemorative milestones of 60 years of independence and 60 years of membership in the United Nations. And this morning's flag-raising ceremony is an emotional reminder of that occasion 60 years ago when our first Prime Minister, Sir Alexander Bustamante, witnessed the hoisting at the United Nations headquarters of the black, green, and gold. That raising, that very act of raising our flag, simultaneously elevated the hopes and aspirations of a small island country entering the global arena with outsized visions for its future. Today, notwithstanding our challenges, in that same spirit of optimism, Jamaica reaffirms her commitment to the vision and work of the United Nations and our adherence to the principles of multilateralism and indeed the place multilateralism holds as a core principle of our foreign policy. Our strong belief in multilateralism continues to underpin our cooperation with member states and other stakeholders within the United Nations system. 60 years in the life of a nation is a relatively brief period. Yet we reflect with a deep sense of pride on the significant global impact our small island developing state has made. Jamaica has contributed a great deal to global efforts for peace, disarmament, the right to self-determination, the condemnation of terrorism, advocacy on sustainable debt management and financing for development, the promotion of the integrity of the international trading system, the promotion of the empowerment of women, international law, protection of the environment, and indeed, the promotion of human rights. Jamaica has consistently participated in relevant actions at bilateral, regional, and multilateral levels, fully convinced that the solution to global challenges requires flexibility and creativity, and it requires cooperation. Jamaicans have proudly served in distinct leadership roles in United Nations, organizations, agencies, and bodies, and in that notable tradition, it is our honor, and thank you for recognizing Dr. Kani, as it is our honor to serve as one of the vice presidents of the 77th session of the General Assembly, a capacity which also afforded me the very brief privilege of presiding over a segment of proceedings last month. But ladies and, and gentlemen, in 1962, 
Jamaica's very first policy statement to the United Nations General Assembly included a proposal for the declaration of an international year for human rights to mark the 20th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 1963, then Senator Hugh Scherer delivering our policy statement for the second time, proposed that the year 1968 be so declared. And to our credit, that year was observed as proposed. This was just the first of very many initiatives launched by Jamaica at the multilateral level, strengthening our legacy as a small state with a big vision and big ideas. In this connection, I also share that the United Nations Habitat and Human Settlements Foundation was established as a result of an initiative by Jamaica when it took the lead in piloting this action through the governing council of the UN Environment Program at its second session and at the General Assembly in 1974, which decided to establish the foundation. UNEP's overall mandate in the field of human settlements was revised and limited to environmental aspects and consequences of the planning of human settlements, an important issue domestically at this time. All other responsibilities for human settlement matters were assigned to the newly created UN Center for Human Settlements. And Jamaica gave consistent support throughout this process to the institutional development of habitat and served on the governing council of the Commission on Human Settlements. Today's UN habitat evolved from this process. Another area of note is our commitment to safeguarding our world's oceans and marine resources. Our historic leadership role in the development and eventual adoption of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea ranks among our proudest and most noteworthy contributions to multilateralism since independence. The convention opened for adoption in Montego Bay on the 10th of December 1982 making this a seminal year as we join the international community in commemorating the 40th anniversary of its entry into force. We are proud and honored to host the International Seabed Authority, which is one of the three mechanisms provided for under the UNCLOS. Jamaica is committed to the work that is being done to secure the resources for the area for the benefit of mankind, as well as to preserve and protect the environmental integrity of the deep seabed. Some six decades later, some six decades after independence, we continue our legacy of leadership at the United Nations in areas which reflect the progression and focus over time to embrace the new endeavors of the international community. Just last year, Jamaica spearheaded the successful adoption of a resolution on global media and information literacy which calls for the promotion of media and information literacy over a one-week period from the 24th to the 31st of October each year. Endorsed by all member states, this pursuit is intended to offer a viable, sustainable, collective, and global approach to countering the increase in disinformation, misinformation, hate speech, and online harassment. The original initiative was led by Jamaica's permanent delegation to UNESCO and unanimously adopted by the UNESCO General Conference in November 2019 in Paris. Even more recently, in delivering our national policy statement in the general debate of the 77th session in September this year, Prime Minister Andrew Holness called for the observation of a Global Tourism Resilience Day on the 17th of February. This annual commemoration will serve to encourage a consistent examination of resilience building in the tourism sector in the face of persistent global disruptions to sustainable tourism and sustainable development. As a highly tourism dependent country and indeed region, Jamaica has invested in building resilience in the sector and encourages states to work together to commemorate this day in 2023 when we will host the Global Tourism Resilience Conference at the University of the West Indies Regional Headquarters. Here again, we see the evolution of the work of the United Nations and Jamaica's own role in keeping in step with these realities. Certainly, our partnership with Canada as in the sustainable development, or rather, in the financing for development, sorry, there were two, 
financing for development for the era of COVID-19 and beyond, which developed significant streams of policy thinking, which actually changed how the international financial institutions treated with the matter of small island and in fact middle income countries and highly indebted countries coming out of the pandemic. These are just a few of the areas in which Jamaica has in partnership executed strong leadership on the international stage and through the multilateral system. Dr. Connie, ladies and gentlemen, membership of United Nations bodies is another way through which Jamaica has sought to maintain an active role and visible profile in international affairs. Over these 60 years, Jamaica has had the opportunity to offer valuable service on a number of United Nations organs, organizations, and subsidiary bodies. We're proud of the country's long history of involvement in areas that span the gamut of international affairs, from human rights to development and international law. Our participation has included membership on the Security Council, the International Civil Service Commission, United Nations Environment Programs Governing Council, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, UNESCO's Executive Board, and the, Dub and the World Health Organization's Executive Board, among many others. Jamaica also currently holds membership of the Council on the International Maritime Organization, the Council of the International Civil Aviation Organization, the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, the Legal and Technical Committee of the International Seabed Authority, as well as its Finance Committee. We are similarly proud of the legacy of highly qualified and world-renowned Jamaicans who have occupied places of prominence in key UN positions. We recall Jamaica's former permanent representative to the UN, Ambassador Patricia Durant, who was appointed the first UN Ombudsman in 2002. Judge Patrick Robertson, world-renowned jurist and former judge of the International C Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia, now is the first Jamaican to sit on the International Court of Justice and is serving his second term. As well as Dr. Kathy Ann Brown, who serves as the first Jamaican and first Caribbean woman on the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. They sit in the pantheon of many other celebrated Jamaicans globally. Our commitment is to maintain this trajectory of high performance and impact. With this goal in mind, we cherish the excellent relationships we enjoy with the UN agencies, which have offices in Kingston and indeed in UN House. We are pleased to have the opportunity for direct engagement and collaboration to support national development initiatives, especially towards the most vulnerable in our society. Throughout our partnership, we can focus on building back together for peace and prosperity. The challenges we face today are indeed complex, interconnected, and cascading. Not unlike times past, there are those who question again the value of multilateralism, and the ability of the UN to effectively tackle the difficulties. But some 35 years ago, just over halfway through our membership, we all underwent a process of reflection on the very question, what is the use of the United Nations? And the answer we offered then remains applicable today. Whatever its shortcomings, the past years have revealed, and it is an indispensable institution. We remain fully convinced that the alternative to a functioning multilateral system is a more dangerous and divided world that will threaten to marginalize and erode the security and development of small states in particular. We must all, therefore, continue to emphasize the tremendous benefit to our nations and our people of a robust and well-functioning multilateral system. Small states like Jamaica are of necessity the strongest advocates for multilateralism. And as I have said on several other occasions, multilateral cooperation will be key to getting us back on the road to sustainable economic growth and enhancing resilience to cope with these global challenges. We must, therefore, reaffirm our commitment to a world underpinned by a strong, rules-based multilateral system. With this in mind, Jamaica will continue to play a positive role in the activities of the organs and bodies of the United Nations. We expect that their programs and projects will complement those introduced at the national and regional levels and believe that our collective efforts will assist 
in achieving our own national development goals. Vision 2030, which aligns with the overarching framework of the Sustainable Development Goals, continues to be our guide. I close, therefore, by echoing the sentiments of the Secretary General's message for UND 2022. The United Nations is the product of hope. As we mark UND, let us renew our hope and conviction in what humanity can achieve when we work as one in global solidarity. Thank you, and again, happy UN Day. Thank you, Minister, for reminding us of the very active, influential, and impactful global work and interventions of our big, small island. Please give her another round of applause. We are now at the focal moment of this morning's event, where we will now raise the flags of Jamaica and the United Nations. Following my instructions for each group, we will be escorted to the courtyard by the cadets of the Caribbean Maritime University. They will ensure that we are in place for the exercise. When we are all in place, the cadets will begin their march and the flag raising will begin. The completion of the anthem is the end of part one of this formal event, but we will remain in place for the capturing of four photographs. Following this, we invite our guests to join us for coffee and refreshment and our participants in the high level panel to join us in the ISA briefing room on the first floor. I now invite Cadet Scott and Cadet Fairman to escort Minister Johnson Smith and Resident Coordinator Gary Keneal to their positions. Cadets. I now invite Cadet Mundell and Cadet Denhart to now escort Secretary General ISA, members of the Diplomatic Corps, and the United Nations country team to their positions. They will also escort Mrs. Natalie Nita Garvey, Member of Parliament, and Senator the Honorable Leslie Campbell, State Minister, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. Cadets. Cadet Daly and Cadet Gutierrez will now escort the staff, retirees, and other special guests to their positions. Cadets. We may all join now on the outside.
United Nations is the product of hope. The hope and resolve following the Second World War to move beyond global conflict to global cooperation. Today, our organization is being tested like never before. But the United Nations was made for moments like these. Now more than ever, we need to bring to life the values and principles of the UN Charter in every corner of the world by giving peace a chance and ending conflicts that jeopardize lives, futures and global progress, by working to end extreme poverty, reduce inequalities and rescue the sustainable development goals, by safeguarding our planet, including by breaking our addiction to fossil fuels and kick-starting the renewable energy revolution, and by finally balancing the scales of opportunity and freedom for women and girls and ensure human rights for all. As we mark UN Day, let us renew our hope and conviction in what humanity can achieve when we work as one in global solidarity. Hi, I'm Gary Keneal, the UN Resident Coordinator here in Jamaica. The UN Country Team is proud to have supported the completion of Jamaica's Voluntary National Review under the committed leadership of the government of Jamaica. I want to first thank the team of the Planning Institute of Jamaica and its Director General, Dr. Wayne Henry, for their strategic engagement as together we track Jamaica's implementation and progress towards Agenda 2030. Building on our strong partnership with the PIOJ, the UN country team with RCO leadership work closely with government to consult, agree, and define the needs for the VNR. With guidance from the Planning Institute, Jamaica's VNR has been enriched with an assessment on the impact of COVID-19 on social protection, tourism, education, and the labor markets with digitalization as a cross-cutting issue. It contains dedicated chapters of review on SDGs 2, 13, 14, and SDG 15. It includes a thematic report on strengthening the corporate social responsibility framework for the SDGs in Jamaica, as well as an assessment of Jamaica's alignment with the SDGs and recommendations for strengthening local SDG action. The final VNR document, strongly guided by the vision of the Jamaican government, reflects the most up-to-date body of evidence and socioeconomic progress in areas such as climate change development and impacts, the sustainable use of oceans, seas, and marine resources, as well as efforts to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of Earth. With UN support, this SDG tracking process was also able to embody the views of Jamaican youth through insightful consultations conducted with young people. The end product is a document that we are all extremely proud of. I am particularly happy that the RCO was able to coordinate in its preparation and that we were able to support and ensure that the voices from many different stakeholders, including young Jamaicans, private sector, government and NGOs, often left behind, are reflected in this report and will be heard at this year's high-level political forum. 
With the government of Jamaica, we are planning for nationwide dissemination of this VNR through among many channels, the national launch of a new web-based SDG platform. And in this way, we hope to further inspire and coalesce public engagement around the SDGs. Global events continue to challenge our resolve. This is the time to release the accelerator on our path towards the SDGs. With real commitment, the right policies and investment, strong partnerships, we can make significant progress towards the SDGs. This will of course require sharing best practices and challenges as well as lessons learned so that all countries around the world can strengthen policies and institutions and mobilize multi-stakeholder support and partnerships. The VNR offers the opportunity to do so. The UN country team under my leadership stands ready to work closely with Jamaica and its partners to build and accelerate its progress towards achieving the 2030 Agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you to all my doctors. Them. Thank you, nurse. Thanks to the teachers. Big up the sanitation work at them. Thank all of you guys. Thank you. Big up all of the frontline work at them. Them deserve a thanks. Big up the police was thanks for the soldier them. Big up for the fisherman, the man, the farmer. Saying every time. Thank you to all the frontline workers responding to COVID-19 and keeping the Jamaican economy alive. From your efforts, Jamaica will recover and build forward better. We salute you, our heroes on the front line. We owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you for your service. The Joint SDG Fund is committed to strengthening resilience and ending the vulnerabilities of small island developing states. The multiplicity of socioeconomic and environmental vulnerabilities, in addition to the shocks caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, have been detrimental to the island nations. But SIDS are resilient. They are building forward better by developing innovative financing solutions to strengthen the protection of vulnerable groups and creating greener and bluer economies. Sustainable growth will require economic diversification and greater participation from a young, skillful workforce. And to lessen the effects of disasters, access to modern, innovative technologies led by digitization are critical. For economic growth and food production, healthy oceans are vital for the well-being of coastal communities by improving livelihood sectors of fisheries and ecotourism. To secure these smart investments, mobilizing partnerships with the private sector, civil society and governments are fundamental to empowering small island developing states to succeed in reaching the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm Charmaine Blair Stewart. I'm a farmer on the PJ Agro Park in St. Thomas. I am a cassava planter. I have seasonal cup of onion, Irish potato, sweet potatoes, and pumpkin. Since the onset of COVID-19, many female farmers like Charmaine 
have limited or no access to their usual markets. Many have lost produce valued at thousands of dollars needed to support their families. The challenge that I face mostly is lack of storage facility. I, mean, I harvested 23,000 pounds of Irish potato. And of that 23,000 pounds, I sold 3,131 pounds. Other farmers across the country need to market their produce. The produce suffered. Through the purchase of locally grown produce, the project will create a secure market for rural female farmers while meeting the food and nutrition demands of vulnerable families. These families will receive food care packages that will include locally grown fruits and vegetables. By supporting local supply chains, we are supporting livelihoods reducing food and nutrition insecurity, and enhancing Jamaica's agricultural response and recovery to COVID-19. So we're not in a sorry. Who cut and go through up and get rich soon? First class on a plane taking off to the moon. We're not sleeping the streets and we're not pushing no room. Cut a beer about things in a detention room. Beer about things in a detention room. Pure attention in a detention room. No things are born in a detention room. Take the to detention room. You know what I can't understand? <laughs> I can't understand how my own friends did not like my picture on Instagram. So who tell us that we are friends? You know, to say you yeah, Fat girl, no hot girl. How much time you forgot to tell us to stop posting for Instagram because you're door ready yet. You're door ready and yet. And that's a number one. As a matter of fact, boom boom, I'm thirsty. I'll get me a little water. I want a bag of juice. <laughs> Hurry up. I can't sit next to you? Sure. I want to eat. Omar. I want to you. Yo, I'm going to kill myself, you know, man. What you say? You're going to take your precious life because of them two bully there, eh? All right, I'm going to tie them up one one and kill them. Then that makes sense to you, Omar? Eh? Come again, man. That makes sense to you? I sure nobody not trouble you, you know. They're afraid of your mother? No. They're not afraid of me, nor my mother, but I am a strong girl. I'm going to take foolishness. And furthermore, Duppy. No, I ooh, for frighten. That easy for you, say. Omar, come and talk to you. Yo, Sean, the detention room, you're a mash up thing, you know. So now that me attack one minute, you know we have holy pa business to take care of yeah. the rule. Yeah, man, you know what kind of business you know in a... Yo, my girl, what I'm to you? You always go like you want to come spoil up my thing. You need to do better, that's all me I tell you. Do better, that's your say? Yes, do better. So you don't think the world school know where your man I do? Well, wipe the beam out of your eye first. Yeah, and you wipe the beam out of your man, yeah. You know, say so you embarrass me at school, yeah? So we all try to say I don't impress. Yeah, tell me, say the expensive here with me by you. You know, like them things, eh? You are going like saying, you know, where this come from, you know? Yeah, what? Well, I have some important cards to make, Zane. This scamming, this bullying, and this loan sharking people, come on, do better, man. You want to know, girl, yeah, man? Yo, in common like, you don't know what this thing really is about, you know? You don't know what this education thing is really about. Oh, uh, all right. This thing is about making a living. Money have to make yeah. the real way. Yeah. What must I say? Money have to make the real way. Yeah. I say for money have to make, scamming have to go on. The real way. Yeah, I have seen this bullying thing. 
It's a survival thing, you understand? Yeah, it's a gangster living. It's a survival thing. And me can't survive without my tribe. Yeah? <laughs> Guys, I saw no really want to live. That's not funny. No, me can't live so. Being a change. Being a change. Take responsibility now. Making a choice. Be bold and use your voice. Hey, yeah. We're tired of the bully. It's coming at all. We can't stop living. No, make it at all. Hallelu, corn, pak choy, sweet pepper, hot pepper. We also do escalion and at times we do cabbage and beetroot. Before COVID, for our school garden, the students would have gotten the chickens to eat. We, at one time, we also had layers and so that assisted in our breakfast program where we usually produce breakfast in the mornings for our students. And on the farm, we also have plantain, and so the plantain was also used for our breakfast program. Since COVID, we have scaled down because the students are not here, but whatever we produce now, community members would purchase, and when teachers come in from time to time, they would also purchase these things. We have not put in back any chickens since COVID, except for when we had students coming back for SBA, then we had to do a batch of birds. And of course, we sold those to community members. But before that last Christmas, December, we also did packages for our students. And so they also got chickens and whatever else we had on the farm at that time. So whatever we earned, as much as is possible, we used it back on the farm and some goes into our cash reserve. So with the support from FAO and 4-H under the Homegrown Agricultural Program, we have benefited from a thousand gallon black drum and fittings and drip holes. This has helped us immensely because where we are located in southwest St. Elizabeth, it is rather on the dry plains of St. Elizabeth. So you came this afternoon, we got rains and we're grateful for that. But under the normal circumstances, the times are very dry and hot. And so with the assistance where we can just fill our drum, turn it on to water when we want to, when we have our seedlings planted, it will ensure that we have vegetables at all times. Our students are from the lower socioeconomic families and they usually depend on us for food. Five days per week, we usually cook for them. And we know that if we have it from our farm, we can take it to them. We know where to find them.
United Nations is the product of hope. The hope and resolve following the Second World War to move beyond global conflict to global cooperation. Today, our organization is being tested like never before. But the United Nations was made for moments like these. Now more than ever, we need to bring to life the values and principles of the UN Charter in every corner of the world. By giving peace a chance and ending conflicts that jeopardize lives, futures and global progress. By working to end extreme poverty, reduce inequalities and rescue the Sustainable Development Goals. By safeguarding our planet, including by breaking our addiction to fossil fuels and kick-starting the renewable energy revolution and by finally balancing the scales of opportunity and freedom for women and girls and ensure human rights for all. As we mark UN Day, let us renew our hope and conviction in what humanity can achieve when we work as one in global solidarity. Hi, I'm Gary Keneal, the UN Resident Coordinator here in Jamaica. The UN country team is proud to have supported the completion of Jamaica's voluntary national review under the committed leadership of the government of Jamaica. I want to first thank the team of the Planning Institute of Jamaica and its Director General, Dr. Wayne Henry, for their strategic engagement as together we track Jamaica's implementation and progress towards Agenda 2030. Building on our strong partnership with the PIOJ, the UN country team with RCO leadership work closely with government to consult, agree, and define the needs for the VNR. With guidance from the Planning Institute, Jamaica's VNR has been enriched with an assessment on the impact of COVID-19 on social protection, tourism, education, and the labor markets with digitalization as a cross-cutting issue. It contains dedicated chapters of review on SDGs 2, 13, 14, and SDG 15. It includes a thematic report on strengthening the corporate social responsibility framework for the SDGs in Jamaica, as well as an assessment of Jamaica's alignment with the SDGs and recommendations for strengthening local SDG action. The final VNR document, strongly guided by the vision of the Jamaican government, reflects the most up-to-date body of evidence and socioeconomic progress in areas such as climate change development and impacts, the sustainable use of oceans, seas, and marine resources, as well as efforts to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of Earth. With UN support, this SDG tracking process was also able to embody the views of Jamaican youth through insightful consultations conducted with young people. The end product is a document that we are all extremely proud of. I am particularly happy that the RCO was able to coordinate in its preparation and that we were able to support and ensure that the voices from many different stakeholders, including young Jamaicans, and NGOs often left behind are reflected in this report and will be heard at this year's high-level political forum. With the government of Jamaica, we are planning for nationwide dissemination of this VNR through, among many channels, the national launch of a new web-based SDG platform. And in this way, we hope to further inspire and coalesce public engagement around the SDGs. Global events continue to challenge our resolve. This is the time to release the accelerator on our path towards the SDGs. With real commitment, the right policies and investment, strong partnerships, we can make significant progress towards the SDGs. This will of course require sharing best practices and challenges as well as lessons learned so that all countries around the world can strengthen policies and institutions and mobilize multi-stakeholder support and partnerships. The VNR offers the opportunity to do so. The UN country team under my leadership stands ready to work closely with Jamaica and its partners to build and accelerate its progress towards achieving the 2030 agenda. Thank you very much. 
Thank you to all my doctors. Them. Thank you, nurse. Thanks to the teachers. Big up the sanitation work of them. Thank all of you guys. Thank you. Big up all of the frontline work of them. Them deserve a thanks. Big up the police force. Thanks to the soldier. Them. Big up the fisherman, the man, the farmer. Saying every time. Thank you to all the frontline workers responding to COVID-19 and keeping the Jamaican economy alive. From your efforts, Jamaica will recover and build forward better. We salute you, our heroes on the front line. We owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you for your service. The Joint SDG Fund is committed to strengthening resilience and ending the vulnerabilities of small island developing states. The multiplicity of socioeconomic and environmental vulnerabilities, in addition to the shocks caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, have been detrimental to the island nations. But SITs are resilient. They are building forward better by developing innovative financing solutions to strengthen the protection of vulnerable groups and creating greener and bluer economies. Sustainable growth will require economic diversification and greater participation from a young, skillful workforce. And to lessen the effects of disasters, access to modern, innovative technologies led by digitization are critical. For economic growth and food production, healthy oceans are vital for the well-being of coastal communities by improving livelihood sectors of fisheries and ecotourism. To secure these smart investments, mobilizing partnerships with the private sector, civil society and government are fundamental to empowering small island developing states to succeed in reaching the sustainable development goals. Charmaine Blair Stewart. I'm a farmer on the PJ Agro Park in St. Thomas. I am a cassava planter. I have seasonal cup of onion, Irish potato, sweet potatoes, and pumpkin. Since the onset of COVID-19, many female farmers like Charmaine have limited or no access to their usual markets. Many have lost produce valued at thousands of dollars needed to support their families. The challenge that I face mostly is lack of storage facility. I, mean, I harvested 23,000 pounds of Irish potato and of that 23,000 pounds I sold 3,131 pounds. Other farmers across the country need to market their produce. The produce suffered. Through the purchase of locally grown produce, the project will create a secure market for rural female farmers while meeting the food and nutrition demands of vulnerable families. These families will receive food care packages that will include locally grown fruits and vegetables. By supporting local supply chains, we are supporting livelihoods reducing food and nutrition insecurity, and enhancing Jamaica's agricultural response and recovery to COVID-19.
So we're not in a sorry. We cut and go through and we get rich soon. First class on a plane, second half to the moon. We're not sleeping in the street and we're not pushing no room. Cause I'm here about things in a detention room. Things for Instagram because you're door ready yet. You're door ready and yet. That's a number one. As a matter of fact, boom boom, I'm thirsty. Go get me a little water. I may want a bag of juice. <laughs> Hurry up. I can't sit next to you? Sure. I want to him. Omar, I want to you. Yo, I'm going to kill myself, you know, man. What you say? You're going to take your precious life because of them two bully there, eh? All right, me going to tie them up one one and kill them. Then that makes sense to you, Omar, eh? Come again, man. That makes sense to you. I sure nobody not trouble you, you know. They afraid of your mother? No. They're not afraid of me, no, my mother, but I am a strong girl. I'm going to take foolishness. And furthermore, Duppy, no one who, to frighten. That easy for you, say. Welcome back, everyone. It's me again, Jermaine McKenzie, Development Coordination Officer in the Resident Coordinator's Office, and your host for this morning. Welcome to our presentation of Jamaica's Voluntary National Review, the VNR Report, on the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. Now this morning's activity features a high-level panel discussion on the localization of the SDGs and the lessons we've learned so far from the VNR. Time wouldn't allow us to do the deep dive that the VNR deserves, but today we'll facilitate uh, what my RCO strategist describes as a short, sharp shock into the issues. And I won't stand in the way, so let me first acknowledge some extra special guests. Please make them welcome at the end. Dr. Gary Keneal, UN Resident Coordinator. Mr. Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. Dr. Wayne Henry, Director General, Planning Institute of Jamaica. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General, PIOJ, and the staff of the PIOJ. And our respected panel of experts, whom you'll hear from later on. Dr. Wesley Hughes, Development Economist. Orville Levy, Co-Chair of the Jamaica Youth Advisory Council. Nancy Pinchas, Executive Director of the Council of Voluntary Social Services. Marlette Wellington, Director of Planning at Trelawney Parish Council. And Latoya Clark, Program Director at the Sustainable Development Goal Secretariat at the PIOJ. We also have with us High Commissioners, Ambassadors, Heads of Diplomatic Missions. Good morning again and a special welcome to you all. Now, because you've been here for a while and you've joined us this morning, made this Monday morning experience your first stop, I think you deserve to give yourselves a round of applause, please. This is the second VNR, and we see th the data of what we figured that the triple C's of COVID, a Russian conflict in Ukraine, and climate action has significantly disrupted SDG progress. To get back on track, Jamaica's national development priorities require all hands on deck. Jamaica boasts strong systems and institutions, and together with strong partnerships, the right policies, and multi-stakeholder investments, we are and can recover strong. Let's take a look at this video product from the PIOJ, highlighting how the lessons learned from the VNR can point us to a stronger socioeconomic recovery from COVID-19 and propel us back on track for greater gains 
on the Sustainable Development Agenda. Take a look. Since 2018, when Jamaica presented its first voluntary national review, VNR, the country has made significant progress in advancing the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs through the Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan. Prior to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, key economic indicators trended in a positive direction, with gains made in reducing unemployment and the debt-to-GDP ratio, which reached historic lows. Gains are currently being made in social protection through sound strategies and multidimensional approaches that ensure no one is left behind. The rates of poverty and extreme poverty trended downward with the implementation of key social interventions that widened access to social services. Our work continues to be supported by strong institutions, local and international partners providing technical cooperation and financing to achieve our national development priorities. We in the private sector recognize our role as key actors in the development agenda. Our vision for corporate social responsibility sees companies aligning with the national development agenda while guided by the highest of ethical standards in our business practices and relationships with the local community. There is a role for the private sector, not only in economic development, but also in social and environmental development. We can protect our natural habitat and ensure a healthy, sustainable future for those that come after us. Investments in human capital promote health and development of a skilled labor force to drive economic growth and well-being of the population. The government invests one of the largest shares of the national budget in education, signaling its commitment to developing children and youth. Building a safe and inclusive society requires a localizing national development that allows every citizen to see their role in achieving the goals. Today, we have a unique opportunity to generate an inclusive, resilient, and green recovery that ensures a broad and lasting rise in prosperity, especially for the poorest, most marginalized, highly indebted, and vulnerable. It is an opportunity we cannot afford to miss. Participate with our virtual community by posting on social media using the handle and hashtag UN Jamaica. Today we are graciously hosted by the International Seabed Authority in their freshly minted media room. We are grateful for the hospitality extended and to welcome us is Michael Lodge, Secretary General. Prior to his election as Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority in July 2016, he served as Deputy to the Secretary General and Legal Counsel. With 28 years of experience as a public international lawyer, Michael Lodge has a strong background in the field of law of the sea, as well as years of judicial experience in the UK and South Pacific. To make us truly welcome, I invite Secretary General himself, Mr. Michael Lodge. Make him welcome. Well, good morning, everybody, and it is really a great pleasure to welcome you all to the headquarters of the International Seabed Authority on this UN Day. A particularly warm welcome to all those who are watching online. I understand from uh, Gary that there are many people uh, online, and a particularly warm welcome also this morning to our colleagues from the UN country team. Well, the International Seabed Authority is an autonomous organization. What does that mean? It's a horrible word, but you see it, uh, every reference you see to the uh, ISA, you see this uh, autonomous international organization. Well, what it means is that we are not part of the UN. We are created by a treaty. 
which is a United Nations treaty, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But we are in a very close relationship with the United Nations and have been ever since uh, the beginning. We are a permanent observer to the General Assembly. We are part of key UN bodies such as the International Civil Service Commission and, and others. So we play a very, uh, we have a very close relationship with uh, the United Nations, but we are not uh, the United Nations. Now why is that important? Well, the main reason is that because apart from UNEP, which is a UN program and is based in Nairobi, the International Seabed Authority is the only global organization that is headquartered in the global south. And more than that, it's the only global organization that is based in a small island developing state. And I think that's an incredibly uh, powerful statement of who we are. It's not that we want to distance ourselves from the UN, not at all, but it is an incredibly important statement of what this organization is all about. This building where you are today has been our interim headquarters since 1984 and our permanent headquarters since 1999 when we entered into a host country agreement with the government of Jamaica. We are incredibly proud of the fact that we are here in Jamaica. I would like to acknowledge today all that the host government has done for us uh, over the years. Uh, it's been uh, an experience being here, but uh, one that we are incredibly proud of. And I know that the government of Jamaica is also very proud of the fact that the authority is headquartered here in Kingston. And you heard that uh, from the minister uh, in her statement this morning. On behalf of the ISA, I would like to say to Gary and the UN country team that we look forward very much to your presence in the building. It's been a long road, but uh, I know that things are happening. I look forward to working together with you uh, and the rest of the UN country team for the benefit of the staff, and in particular for the security, safety, and good working environment uh, of all of the staff working for ISA and the UN. Well, today uh, we celebrate UN Day uh, and uh, the national contribution of Jamaica to the SDGs. Uh, it's uh, very much Gary's celebration and uh, we are very much uh, welcoming you uh, in the building and uh, looking forward to uh, the discussion. The one com uh, comment I would like to make about it is, is that we also have the SDGs at the forefront of everything that we do in the International Seabed Authority. ISA, as an organization, not just as a secretariat, but as an organization, we stand fully committed to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. It may interest you to note, and uh, I'm not sure if there are copies in the room, but we can certainly provide them, that an independent report that uh, we had commissioned just last year uh, identified that the International Seabed Authority and the legal regime created by the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea actually makes a substantial contribution to 12 out of the 17 SDGs. And I, I would like to take the opportunity to draw that report to your attention. Jamaica, I know, uh, is very uh, proud of its role within the International Seabed Authority. It uh, expressly has stated within the Assembly of the Authority that its contribution to the SDGs is also realized through ISA, in particular its contribution to SDG 14 and the wider contribution of the Law of the Sea to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda. 
But I wish you uh, a very substantial uh, and very productive discussion. I hope you enjoy using this room, which, as Jermaine mentioned, is uh, rather recently commissioned, uh, one of the latest additions to uh, our headquarters. We are very pleased to make it available to the rest of the UN country team, and we hope that you will join us in this building in due course and make the ISA headquarters part of your home as well as our home. So congratulations on UN Day. Uh, congratulations, Gary, for putting all this together, and I wish you all the very best for a successful day, not only today, but I understand there are also events taking place throughout the week. Welcome again, and thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary General Lodge. Colleagues, you heard from him earlier today, but I think it is critical to highlight that Dr. Gary Keneal is quite intimately associated with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In 2008, and for two years, he sat at the helm of the UN Development Program's then Millennium Development Goals support. And in 2012, he took the role of Senior Advisor to Liberian President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in her role as co-chair of the UN high-level panel on the post-2015 development agenda, which grew into what we now call the SDGs. This, I think, explains a little bit his strong commitment to the global roadmap that is the Agenda 2030, and his even higher commitment to ensure that Jamaica remains on an accelerated path to achieving the SDGs for the good of all its citizens. We are quite fortunate to have this level of expertise serving our UN country team at this time. And so it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Gary Keneal, who will also then introduce Dr. Wayne Henry to deliver the remarks. Thank you. Make him welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jermaine. Colleagues, friends, thank you so much for remaining with us in this second half of our UN Day celebration. This is it's really a, truly an honor to be recognizing UN Day with all of you, uh, especially on the occasion of presenting Jamaica's VNR and SDG progress to the nation. Allow me to first really uh, recognize and uh, thank especially um, Secretary General Michael Lodge of the International Seabed Authority and his team for a very warm welcome and the hospitality extended to Jamaica's UN country team, evidence to the fact that we are already uh, officially calling this our one UN house. Of course, let me recognize Dr. Wayne Henry, Director General of the PIOJ, of course, Mrs. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General External Corporation Management and Project Development, PIOJ, members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of our UN country team, the distinguished medals, members of the high-level VNR panel, uh, Mr. Orville Levy, co-chair of the Youth Council of Jamaica, Dr. Wesley Huge, uh, private sector representative, Mrs. Marlette Wellington, director of planning, uh, municipal cooperation, and Dr. Christine Hendricks, executive director, Jamaica Council of Persons with Disabilities, and Mrs. Nancy uh, Pingas, Pinchas, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, executive director, Council of Voluntary Social Services, Members of the press, Jamaican, and friends in the diaspora, guests, ladies, and gentlemen. The UN country team is proud to be supporting the government of Jamaica in presenting its voluntary national review and facilitating this national conversation on lo localizing sustainable development goals. We are also extremely happy to have supported the completion of Jamaica's voluntary national review, working with the team of its planning institute led by Dr. Henry. Today we will hear the lessons we've learned from this process and from some of the people most involved in making the VNR happen. Colleagues, the members of this team made an excellent representation of Jamaica at this year's high-level political forum in New York. We were extremely, extremely proud. It got immense feedback and certainly a lot of interest. I can tell you that our Secretariat colleagues took particularly note of our VNR process, including the voices from many different stakeholders, including young Jamaicans, private sector, government, and communities of NGOs often left behind in these discussions. So like you, I'm looking forward to hearing and relearning from their insights and expertise for the way forward. 
But very quickly, how did we get to this point? Well, building on our strong partnership with the Planning Institute, the UNCT, the UN country team, worked closely with the government to consult, agree, and define the needs of the VNR. In the spirit of the Living as One, UN agencies, funds, and programs came together to secure the appropriate technical assistance and resources needed to ensure the full realization of the government's vision for the VNR. With guidance from the Planning Institute, UN support was able to ensure that, uh, that the report document was enriched with an assessment on the impact of COVID-19, that the VNR contained dedicated chapters of review on SDG 2, 13, 14, and 15, and in the process, we, of course, secured thematic report on strengthening the corporate social responsibility framework for the SDGs in Jamaica. And finally, we helped ensure that an assessment of Jamaica's alignment with the SDGs, as well as recommendations for strengthening local SDG action, was included in the final report. The final VNR document strongly guided, again, by the vision of, Jama of, of the Jamaican government that builds on the experience of the first VNR, reflects the most up-to-date body of evidence and socioeconomic progress, such as climate change developments and impact, the sustainable use of oceans, seas, and marine resources, as well as efforts to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of land. With our co through our collaboration, this SDG tracking progress was also able to embody the views of Jamaican youth through insightful consultation conducted by young people themselves. So the UN country team is exceptionally proud of this final, final document, and I am particularly happy that the President Coordinator's Office was able to coordinate the participation of the different agencies. Let me also use this opportunity to thank my team, ably led by my team leader, Morgan Murray, uh, who was really very, very much involved in making sure that we were providing effective support to the government. COVID has kept us behind the screen, but believe me, we are very much present and will continue to be very much engaged. Now, earlier this, this year, we committed to not only supporting the development of the VNR, but to strongly supporting the facilitation of its dissemination. Dr. Henry, I'm very happy to report that we are keeping that promise. This month, with your SDG unit, we presented and exposed the VNR and its chapters to over 600 young people from across the island as, at the Governor General's Youth Consultative Conference in Montego Bay. Soon, we will print over 150 copies of the VNR and citizenship guides for distrib distribution. On Thursday's partnership forum, many of our discussions will center on the findings and lessons of the VNR. Thousands of Jamaicans at home and abroad are expected to engage in the partnership dialogue, which will feature well-renowned economists like Jeffrey Sachs, president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Dr. Hygienist Jean Leon, president of the Caribbean Development Bank, and Elliot Harris, UN chief economist and former UN AS assistant secretary general, among others. And obviously, the discussions will include some of the best technical experts in Jamaica, really providing their insight into all this discussion. Today provides an op another opportunity for discourse and sharing with, I don't have the exact number, hopefully Jermaine will keep us soon, but really hundreds of hundreds of persons actually joining us online. From this process, the central and recurring theme is that with real commitment, the right policies and investments, strong partnership, we can make significant progress towards the SDGs. The VNR offers us the opportunity to do so. The VNR is, press, is pointing us back to our common compass, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and of course, Jamaica's Vision 2030 for National Development. Colleagues, the world has and will continue to throw shocks at us. Climate change, conflicts, new pandemics, experiences have emerged. The common compass remains relevant. This is no time for us to lose sight of what is important. Now is the time to stay on course. The data is certain. Countries are better placed to deal with and recover from shocks when they are closer to achieving the sustainable development goals. The UN country team under my leadership stands ready to work closely with Jamaica and its partners to accelerate its progress and sprint to the goals. To tell us more about how we get there and the localized SDG momentum we need, well, the, the momentum we need is the person who knows it best, the Director General of PIOJ himself, our close partner and ally in SDG tracking and in national development. It's really my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Wayne Henry. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. <clears throat> 
I recognize Jermaine McKenzie or Master of Ceremony, of course, Dr. Gary Connell, the United Nations Resident Coordinator, and congratulations, Gary, on uh, well executed so far. Everything we know is going to run well as it has started. Uh, Mr. Michael Lodge, the Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. I recognize Ms. Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General of the PIOJ, and the distinguished panel here who did a tremendous job in New York, right, at the, as you are hearing from the VNR process. And so Marlette and Nancy, Dr. Hughes, Orville, you said, said Wesley, well, I said Dr. Hughes, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so very distinguished panel there. I recognize, of course, uh, Mrs. Latoya Clark, our program director at SDG Secretariat at the PIOJ, who drives a lot of what's happened, has been happening at the, PI, at the PIOJ in this regard. Recognize Mrs. Donna Parchment Brown, our political ombudsman. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, those joining online, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, somebody asked me recently, what do you like most, what do you like best about Switzerland? And I said, well, I'm not quite sure, but the flag is a big plus. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Planning Institute of Jamaica, the PIOJ, joins in celebrating 60 years of partnership between the United Nations and the Government of Jamaica. We welcome the opportunity to share in this event and it is my pleasure to bring remarks highlighting Jamaica's recently concluded voluntary national review process, VNR, for which the United Nations provided both technical and financial support in demonstration of its commitment to partnering with the government of Jamaica. As we reflect on progress and recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, the strength and tenacity of our partnership framework was evident in the progress made. The commitment demonstrated through institutional mechanisms and systems and the high level of responsiveness from civil society. The PIOJ is proud to have led this process on behalf of the government of Jamaica. For approximately seven months, partners coalesced in a process of virtual consultations, reaching more than 725 participants, as well as writing and reviews in which more than 40 technical officers across ministries, departments and agencies participated. In addition to reporting on progress of the, SD, the 17 SDGs through the preparation of the main VNR report, we also completed two thematic studies on the impact of COVID-19 on key sectors and strengthening the localization of the SDGs in keeping with the evidence-based approach that guides our policy and decision making. As we progress in this decade of action and delivery, Strategic and transformative actions are needed to accelerate progress in key development areas. The main messages from the process highlight the importance of economic reform, effective governance, and strong institutional coordination. These have proven fundamental, not only in driving progress and recovery, but also promoting resilience in the development system. The review has further entrenched the role of data and statistics technology and proactive legislation as key to improving support services across sectors. Transformative and accelerated actions such as the development of multidimensional vulnerability and poverty indices are expected to strengthen the response to development challenges and needs. Further, leveraging technology for upskilling labor and improving service delivery is crucial to overcoming systemic barriers and growing factor productivity through public and private research and development initiatives. We remain steadfast in our commitment to the common goals of development and despite the challenges and vulnerabilities we faced, we were able to report on the progress of key development indicators. Among the highlights of this review were the reduced poverty prevalence from 19.3% in 2017 to 11%, and the food poverty rate from 5.4% to 4% in 2019. High enrollment levels of 95% of young persons in school up to grade 11, improvement in gender parity, increase in the percentage of electricity generated from renewables, significant reduction in youth unemployment, Increase in the total protected forest areas. Enacted, we enact, enacted the regulations of the Disabilities Act. 
We updated the nationally determined contribution NDC submitted to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, adjusting the targets for emission reductions from 1.1 to 1.5 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to a range of 1.8 to 2 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. We increased government spending in nominal terms by 42% between 2015 and 2021 while lowering the debt-to-GDP ratio from its high of 153% in 2013 to 94.7% in 2019. And we expanded social protection provisions for vulnerable populations and targeted sectors of the labor market. These achievements are a direct result of the concerted efforts of the government and its partners to promote balanced development to ensure that no one is left behind. In terms of issues and challenges, the review also highlighted that challenges are evident in key sectors, and these challenges must be addressed if we are to meet the 2030 targets. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the ongoing geopolitical crisis have threatened our development gains. Structural and systemic challenges, including low human capital development, climate change vulnerability, fossil fuel dependency, high debt, and low export diversification are critical and must be addressed. Strengthening the means of implementation for the SDGs is therefore required in financing, targeted official development assistance and trade facilitation, science and technology transfer, and building capacities to drive growth. We continue to echo the sentiments of our fellow small island developing states that our multidimensional vulnerabilities must be considered and in the case of Jamaica, we echo the call to our international development partners to take into context the transparency and good, good governance in fiscal management that have been demonstrated. Jamaica continues to deliver on its commitment not only to national development, but also as a global partner and actor in areas such as SDGs financing. We continue to play our part in delivering our international commitments within Agenda 2030, including the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the Paris Agreement. This review process has highlighted the benefit of long-term development planning, which enables us to program responses to crises and to mitigate the impact of threats through coordinated systems and actions. We continue, therefore, to implement the SDGs through Vision 2030 Jamaica, or National Development Plan, demonstrating the country's ownership and commitment to Agenda 2030. The experience and outcome of the 2022 VNR process stand as a reminder of the progress of the achievement on the achievement of the goals, as well as a call to action for domestic and international partnership in the recovery efforts and accelerating development in line with our 2030 target. The companion reports on the impact of COVID-19 and localization support the evidence base for mainstreaming the SDGs and demonstrates necessity for greater alignment to the National Development Plan. The role of government as lead in the national development process remains paramount, and the supportive role of the partnership framework is critical and indispensable, reinforcing the whole of society approach to development as we work toward making Jamaica the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. Thank you very much. God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Henry. We are at the focal moment. So without further ado, help me welcome the moderator for today's panel, Barbara Scott, Deputy Director General, External Cooperation Management, and project development at the PIOJ. Barbara Scott, over to you. Thank you. Am I being heard? Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and um, good morning. It really is a pleasure to be here and to have been asked to moderate this morning's conversation on localization of the SDGs. Before I begin, though, let me add my congratulations to the UN on its 77th anniversary and to recognize 60 years of solid partnership between the UN and the 
government and people of Jamaica, those of us who work on a daily basis with the UN understand the impact of the program, transformative impact. We owe a debt of gratitude to the UN and we look forward to continued cooperation with our UN partners. Uh, colleagues, as you know, the topic for this morning's discussion is localization of the SDGs. By localization, we mean mainstreaming and integrating the SDZ, SDGs at all levels, government, non-state, community, and among special interest groups, the private sector stakeholders. Following the adoption of the SDGs in 2015, Jamaica, through initiatives led by the PIOJ, commenced a process of localization with the integration of the SDGs into the National Development Plan and mainstreaming the SDGs through the whole of society approach. Extensive consultations and capacity building of key stakeholders have been implemented to facilitate alignment of local plans and actions to the Vision 2030 Jamaica and the SDGs. The SDGs are being attained or achieved through implementation of Vision 2030 in Jamaica. Among these initiatives is a program of stakeholder engagement which has involved direct engagement with key stakeholders including youth, the NGO community, CBOs and the private sector as indicated earlier. In the interest of continuity, this year's VNR process focused on strengthening localization of the SDGs including recommendations to address gaps. The process was highly consultative and this method of inclusion throughout the VNR, VNR process was reflected at the high level political forum held in New York through a diverse delegation that represented Jamaica at that event. Our panelists today were members of the delegation to the HLPF. As key stakeholders, they will be sharing their views and perspectives on the topic of localization. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce our panel. To my immediate left is Mrs. Nancy Pinchas. My in immediate right, yes. <laughs> To my immediate right is Mrs. Nancy Pinchas, Executive Director of the CVSS, the Council for of Voluntary Social Services. Nancy is a development economist with over 28 years of experience in managing programs designed to influ influence growth and alleviate poverty. She holds a bachelor's degree in economics, an MPhil in development economics. Nancy worked with us at the Planning Institute. We're just so proud to say that. And she, she has also worked at the Development Bank of Jamaica and has worked also on programs funded by the World Bank and the IDB. To Nancy's immediate right <laughs> is Mrs. Marlett Wellington, who is a passionate professional and she's Director of Planning at the Trelawney Parish Council, the Municipal Corporation, Trelawney Municipal Corporation. She has the, the distinct honor of being the first Director of Planning at the Trelawney Municipal Corporation. 19 years of experience in this position and she holds an Honours Diploma in Physical Planning from the University of Technology as well as a Bachelor of Science degree in Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Technology. In her capacity as Director of Planning, uh, Mrs. Wellington, Marlett if you don't mind, has assisted with the preparation of the Town and Country Planning Confirmed Development Order 2015, facilitated the preparation of the Trelawney Local Sustainable Development Plan, and she oversees the applications management and data automation system in the corporation. To my immediate left <laughs> is Dr. Wesley Hughes, Dr. Hughes, I don't know how many persons know, is a visionary behind Vision 2030. Dr. Hughes is a development economist with over 40 years of experience and knowledge, working across several entities in the Jamaican and Caribbean public sector. Among a number of distinguished positions in the public sector, he has served as financial secretary and as director general of the Planning Institute, and as I had indicated, 
I think you were also the person who start, had the um, idea of the tagline, the place of choice to live and work. It's doctor, yes. Doctor, Doctor, yes, Doctor Hughes. Um, Doctor Hughes holds a doctorate in economics from the University of Sussex and a master's in econ from the University of the West Indies. He is now a partner with consulting firm High Star Consulting Firm and is a member of the private sector organization of Jamaica. Finally, and by no means least, is um, Mr. Orve Levy, who is to Doctor. Hughes's immediate left. <laughs> He's co-chair of the Youth Advisory Council of Jamaica. Orville is a mechanical engineer by profession who has an interest in environment, health and safety, especially in areas of sustainable and renewable energy. He serves as a co-chair of the Youth Advisory Council of Jamaica where he co-heads the council in coordinating the National Youth Parliament of Jamaica and advises government on policies to mainstream youth issues and safeguard their future. He's a recipient of numerous national awards, including the Prime Minister's Youth Award for Excellence, which is a high civilian award that can be conferred on youth in Jamaica. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome our panelists. Okay. So before we begin our conversation this morning, I am going to ask my colleague Latoya Clark, Program Director, for the SDG Secretariat in the Planning Institute to very briefly set the context for this morning's discussion. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Now, Jamaica employs a whole of society <laughs> approach to the implementation of the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. And this approach facilitates engagement of all sectors in meaningful participation in decision making and action to advance national development and the SDGs. It also reinforces the partnership framework in development, facilitating stakeholder dialogue and action through an institutional mechanism with multi-stakeholder representation from government, civil society, academia, private sector, and other stakeholders. The process of localization ensures that the local level priorities and solutions are included in implementation of the SDGs through this whole of society approach. Localizing the SDG therefore promotes action from the bottom up to support SDG delivery as local governments, communities, interest groups, and stakeholders translate national development into their local development policy, plans, and strategies. In our local context, this involves translating the policy imperatives through the strategy framework of Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Plan into sectoral, local and other stakeholder plans to support the implementation and achievement of our national development priorities at these levels. Institutional, sorry, institutionalization of Vision 2030 Jamaica and the SDGs through these means promotes ownership of the development process. The process of localization in policy and planning to promote coherence and integration requires formulating policy and national sector plans that are informed by local evidence and considerations and are designed for local adaptation. It also requires formulating local development plans that are informed by local as well as country and regional and global evidence. Developing local sustainable development plans and other regional, parish and community plans that are aligned with the principles, results and strategy frameworks and overarching theory of change for Vision 2030 and the SDGs. Localization is therefore central to the implementation framework and requires investments in empowering stakeholders, building their capacity for ownership, meaningful participation, 
integration into planning and programming that translates into action that will drive progress across the goals. Localization also acknowledges citizens as agents of change and requires that they are also engaged, empowered, and included, enabling them to both participate in and capitalize on the benefits of development. And so Jamaica began this localization process following its adoption of the SDGs in 2015, and our process of localization included the following. Integrating the goals and targets into Vision 2030 Jamaica National Development Planning Framework, assessing capacity to produce data to effectively monitor the SDGs and further development of a local dashboard which presents the local or parish disaggregated data on the national outcome indicators, establishing an institutional framework with multi-stakeholder representation, and this included government, non-government, civil society, private sector interest groups, as well as youth, academia, and others. Establishing a program of consistent stakeholder engagement, inclusive of the consultative processes that support the prioritization at the national and local levels, and implementing the advancing the SDGs through Vision 2030 Jamaica project, which had three components. Component one was building capacity of local authorities to align their LSDPs to the National Development Plan and the SDGs. Component two was promoting public awareness through direct engagement of citizens. And component three was the development of a discussion guide that would facilitate stakeholders in mainstreaming the SDGs into their plans and programs. We also commenced the process of mainstreaming the SDGs into the local sustainable development planning framework. In this context, the localization of the SDGs is supported by the overarching governance and institutional framework for Vision 2030 Jamaica and the SDGs. The Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development has responsibility for local development. And the Ministry's national level strategic planning, which is guided by Vision 2030 Jamaica and the SDGs, provides the overarching policy and planning framework for local authorities. These local authorities, in turn, through their strategic business plans, implement programs and reports into Vision 2030, both planning and reporting processes. And further to this, the Local Government Act of 2016 provides the legislative framework for actions and activities at the local level which are aligned with the SDGs. In terms of next steps, we continue to implement a program of consistent stakeholder engagement guided by the participatory and consultative approach that we have adopted for development. And this was reflected in our recently concluded voluntary national review process in which community-based organizations, service providers at the local level, non-government organizations, the private sector, interest groups were engaged and consulted and a thematic report on how to strengthen localization was developed as a companion to the main VNR. This report highlighted opportunities to strengthen localization through further knowledge sharing on the SDGs and national development planning, continued partnership at the local level as well as peer learning among local actors. It also demonstrated the opportunity for continued partnership with international development partners like the United Nations and the European Union, which have thus far contributed to projects in monitoring and evaluation and local level engage engagement and planning. We also have considered building on the previous engagements of local authorities and citizens to promote ownership of Vision 2030 Jamaica and the SDGs through actively promoting their role in achievement of the goals. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Latoya, for setting the context for our conversation this morning. We'll now begin our discussion. And my first question is for Dr. Hughes on my immediate left. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hughes, why are the SDGs and Vision 2030 of continued relevance to Jamaica at this time? And how do we effectively mobilize Jamaicans to inspire commitment and promote action on the SDGs? Well, first of all, thank you for having me here this morning. <coughs> and I'd just like to acknowledge the UN body uh, on your achievement of 77 years here and um, our partnership over the years. I have to take the opportunity to say thanks to the UN for uh, being an early partner in Vision 2030. Um, most people don't know, but um, we had a very, very involved process called Civic Dialogue, mm -hmm. which was a, an involved process be between UNDP and the PIOJ and a wide cross-section of Jamaican civil society, NGOs, government, private sector at the time. And we built four scenarios out of that process about how Jamaica's future could evolve. One was called Get Up, Stand Up, which was a very hopeful, uh, almost optimistic view of the future. One was called Paradise Lost, which um, was very dystopian um, in, in its, its outlook. The third one was called um, One One Cocoa, which meant simply going along as we have been, one step forward, two steps backward, and, and, but making some progress. And, of course, the, the fourth one was called um, Nose Must Run, which was a kind of a military-type takeover because we would have been overcome by crime and violence, and the military would, um, would be playing a far more dramatic role. As it turned out, we developed Vision 2030, um, combining almost all four features four elements of, of, of the scenarios that came out. And from that perspective, it became something that was embedded in, the, in, the, in, in Jamaica in the sense that it reflected what we picked up from the society. And that explains why it is relevant and has sustained itself. But also because many players, uh, many of the players in the public, private sector, the bilateral and multilateral agencies, who played a role, have continued to be engaged, and we have been engaged with them. And I think that is what speaks to the l sustainability of it, the relevance, um, because every morning I wake up and I look at the headlines in the newspaper, I can see elements of each of these scenarios coming to the fore. And, and that was one of the features we, we used. We just took a whole series of headlines um, from the newspapers and other media and just put it on the wall and you could see over time different trends, different scenarios, sometimes more hopeful, sometimes like this morning a little bit more um, dystopian. But if you take the, the long-term picture, unfortunately we have maintained this one-one cocoa um, tradition. Some progress and some setback. But what is critical, and, and I hope I'll get a chance to address that in the next question, is the notion that innovation, creativity, is at the heart and soul of it. And that's what came out of the discussions we had over the years um, and would be embedded in Vision 2030 and also embedded in many of the, um, the sustainable development goals, is that Jamaica is a very vibrant very culturally aware society. And despite all the desires for development, we never want the people of Jamaica signal to us we should never lose the essence of who we are um, as, a, as a people. Um, so while we want development and we want GDP growth, we did not want to lose the essence of what it is to be Jamaica and to be Jamaican. And that's what we sought to capture 
in Vision 2030 and um, you know, in implementing the, the goals of the SDGs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hughes, and thanks for reminding us that the SDGs really represent a sort of rallying call for us as Jamaicans to coalesce around. Um, thank you. Um, Nancy, as Executive Director of an Umbrella NGO, the CVSS, what strategies are you currently employing to mainstream the SDGs in your organization? And is there any good practice that you'd wish to share with us? Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having me again and involving the civil society representatives at this level, I think, is a, is a turning point, I think, in how Jamaica and the government of Jamaica considers the importance of civil society, um, which is just how I really wanted to open, is that, you know, the government of Jamaica has the primary responsibility for implementing Vision 2030 and the SDGs, um, but the goals don't belong to government alone. Um, government, businesses, communities, and individuals, we all have to work together. And therefore, the SDGs encompass all of civil society. So hence the importance of, I guess, Barbara's question, what are we doing? Um, I would just like to just sidetrack, um, just to underscore the importance of civil society and the sphere in which we operate. Um, civil society promotes a citizen-centered, collaborative approach to governance. Our member organizations are grassroots organizations. These organizations have active engagement with local actors and citizens in communities across the island. Um, and in order to capitalize on the social mobilization that that, um, that civil society can bring to the table um, comes back to the importance of Barbara's question, um, which is where I wanted to, to just explain the importance of particularly an umbrella organization um, that's been around for 80 years, sitting quietly, but we are an organization um, with a high and a solid reputation um, and I think the time is nigh, and given the structured framework of the SDGs, um, to involve civil society in the implementation and execution towards the achievement of the goals. The, the main challenge, I think, in advancing the SDGs is to make sure that the goals are translated into national and local policies. Latoya alluded um, to that importance. But it is my opinion that as the third sector, civil society is that and serves that critical median role in ensuring that there is this communication and dialogue up from communities and individuals um, who are on the, the, the lowest end of the spectrum, um, coming right back to SDG number one, how do you alleviate poverty? Um, that's where civil society operates. Um, and data is key in measuring this progress but collective collection and reporting systems, as we all are aware, are woefully um, lacking at this point. Um, so in view of our extensive presence on the ground, so to speak, um, we have a critical role um, to contribute to localizing the SDGs and monitoring the progress. So as the umbrella organization, the CVSS has had this idea for quite some time um, that as the umbrella organization, we need to lay the foundation for institutionalizing our system for of scorecards, indicators, to monitor the nationalization and progress of the local goals. So we were you know, initially looking at a web-based electronic monitoring system for SDGs to enable government institutions to report on the implementation of the goals at that level. So accuracy of data is obviously important. And the real test is to be able to collect data to measure those SDG indicators. Um, so really, to close, it, it works both ways. Not only must there, speaking about an abstract system sounds very 
easy and nice. But civil society is also not a homogenous group. Mm -hmm. There are many different types of organizations with varying budgets, um, human resources, levels of exposure and education. So this is not a simple task of going and collecting data or submitting questionnaires. This is a huge, um, I would say, monumental type of program that needs to be very well designed. And obviously, the partners and the actors need to be brought into the fold of how we design such a program to ensure it needs to be easy, it needs to be simple, it needs to, they need to understand what we're collecting and how we're collecting it. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to close to say thank you for the opportunity to be able to reiterate that yeah. um, point. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nancy. And so we're, we're sensing your passion. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for reminding us of the important role that civil society plays um, with respect to localizing the SDGs. I mean, civil society really you are the ones who are able to ensure that the population takes hold of and that the, and that the SDGs become real mm -hmm. in the lives of the men and women of Jamaica. And so thank you also for your interest in data and recognition that data, accurate data, is so critical to ensuring that you're, we, we're monitoring, we're understanding the kind of impact that we're having. It's sometimes not a priority for civil society. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to recognize the, the, the vision that you have. And thank you so much for that. Um, Mrs. Wellington, as director of planning at the Trelawney Municipal Corporation, you can no doubt mm -hmm. influence the extent to which the SDGs gain traction at the community level. Please share some of the strategies you're employing to do this. Good morning, everyone. Let me thank you for the opportunity of inviting the local government through the Trelawney Municipal Corporation and by a wider extent, the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. Um, at the local level, the voluntary local review, how we look at that, it's a tool that can have, at the local level, can have an impact both nationally and globally, at the global level. So for the local authority, of what has happened for us, and as Latoya aptly pointed out, under the Local Governance Act of 2016, Section 21, we are mandated to, to actualize and to also implement the actualization of the SDGs. So in doing that, in that regard, we have um, aligned our strategic business plans. We are tasked by that section to facilitate the preparation of a local sustainable development plan which includes civil society, major stakeholders, and the private sector, and of course the youth, as youth um, in the whole process, because we have found that the stakeholders are critical. They form the critical base for us to achieve the sustainable development goals, and it is important that they are brought in early in the mix, and also we sustain a public education campaign. Because what you find, you'll, f you'll start and everybody's already and in fervor to go and then it just peters out and then you have the one and two faithful that will continue the process and it is evident that achieving the SDG goals is quite important to from a parish level and nationally and also globally so it is, it is important that it is sustained. Thank you. Thank you Marlet and um, recognizing the good work of the Trelawney Municipal Corporation, in that you are formally aligning mm -hmm. your, your local sustainable yes. development plan with the SDGs, and that is commendable. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Levy, over to you. Please tell us how you're seeking as a youth representative and advocate to galvanize youth around the SDGs. All right, thank you so much for having me. Um, it is important for you know, us to recognize um, that no nation can truly grow and move forward without actively involving young people in the process of national development. At the end of the day, you're planning for a future that we will eventually inherit. Mm -hmm. And us playing an active role in the formation of that reality will also aid 
you know, future generation to also maintain that reality that we've helped to shape. So it is, you know, very critical. Um, at the advisory level, of course, we're mandated with mainstreaming youth issues into policies and advising government ministers, departments, agencies on the youth perspective, on the various initiatives and actions that they put forward. Um, that's why I would have mentioned earlier about the alignment of the, um, the long-term strategic plans of the ministries um, with the, the key tenets of um, Vision 2030 and the SDGs. Um, overall in terms of the National Development Plan. And so when policies around that framework come to mind, um, the advisory um, through you know, its channels would advise on those areas. We also have a um, mandate for the formation of the National Youth Parliament of Jamaica, which we have over 100 young persons across the island in respective constituencies who represent the voices of young persons on the ground. And so what they would do is do their consultations, talking to young persons within communities, um, with CBYOs, with um, various stakeholders at the local level to get their perspective um, on where things are at and how they can be improved. And so um, we take that information and we feed it up the ladder. Uh, we then have our sitting of the National Youth Parliament in which we will share those ideas, um, which would be um, next month. So I'll just plug in that. Youth Month is next <laughs> month. Um, and so in that sitting, we would present those ideas. So the National Youth Parliament, though it is televised, etc., it's not just a show. Because after that, we then do a cabinet submission, and then we you know, present that information to um, you know, the respective ministers of government to gain their action um, on those programmatic frameworks and policy actions that would have recommended. So we're taking um, steps at the, 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 the local level, um, and young persons are very eager to participate in you know, the action on nation building, etc. Um, Oftentimes, we are seen, um, as I would have mentioned in a speech a while back, as you know, passive participants mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. beneficiaries to whatever it is that um, we do. And so it, 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 it is not necessarily so. It's important to recognize that young persons, we have a voice. Um, we might be young, and so might say we're inexperienced, but we do bring a lot to the table, mm -hmm. if only some would listen. And so um, we have taken you know, the lead in our respective spheres to see how best we can shape national development. And um, we have young persons, we've formulated programs around um, you know, aiding to um, action youth unemployment. Um, so we've had various sessions with, in partnership with Art and SDA um, and other local groups such as SDC to see how best we can reach um, young persons within community, um, you know, upskilling and building their employability um, so that they can get access into meaningful employment. Um, so that's one we were actively knowing away at some of the um, SDGs and we've, we've, we've successfully done that over the years and we'll continue to do that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Orville. It's good to know that there is enthusiasm and strong yes. interest among our youth. Yeah. There is sometimes a sense that there's skepticism, but thank you for, for letting us know that indeed there is a body of youth who, um, who continue to show strong interest in the SDGs and in national development. Panelists, um, the localization is it's a difficult task. It's a difficult mm -hmm. task, even though um, you know we've heard from you your your, your various initiatives and efforts, um, and you may have made mention to it of, of you may have spoken to to some of the challenges. But could you just maybe give us a little a, a little deeper sense of the kind of challenges that you face in your respective spheres um, with respect to? localizing the SDGs and um, I'm going to ask Dr. Hughes how can the, the um, how can we really work more more um, assiduously with the private sector to look have ensure that the SDGs are localized thanks very much um, the first thing is information and communication mm -hmm. with the private sector I joined the private sector recently um, and what I can assure you is that there's little information, not a lack of interest, but people solve day-to-day -day problems in their businesses and they're, um, they're looking ahead. Um, what they're not seeing very often is enough data and communication and information about the SDG, SDGs um, and how, what role they can play. 
But what is quite clear <laughs> is that government cannot do it all alone. Um, there's insufficient resources, and the overall strategy of the government, for example, in reducing debt will mean that um, it, it will have less room to invest in some of the critical infrastructure areas um, that will, need to, will be needed to drive both um, the climate response but also to transform the economy to a green economy, so to speak, um, for growth and investment to take place. I, I think there needs to be a communication, a broader level communication about the development strategy and the role that the private sector can play. Um, particularly through PPP, because the government, as I said, cannot do it all by itself. The private sector will always seek to invest in areas um, where it can make the highest returns, but sometimes there's not enough information and guidance as to possibilities, um, and so there may be investments which are not sustainable in the long term, but in the short term, the rate of return is fairly high. And, and therefore, there's a tendency to go in that, in that direction. There's nothing evil or wrong about that. It's just that there needs to be a partnership um, in the communication about where the long-term strategy is and where you need to go. Um, so developing a clear private sector, um, public sector partnership arrangement and communicating this, but also having the PPP framework being fairly well articulated and fairly well regulated and people become comfortable with this approach, that needs to be communicated. I know, um, for example, between the Ministry of Finance and the Development Bank, there is a framework and there is a mechanism for driving public-private partnerships. I know the government has emphasized, I've heard the Prime Minister um, many, on many occasions speak about the need for public-private partnership. But I think there needs to be more of a direct communication with the private sector, especially in the area of innovation that will be needed um, for some of the critical solutions, um, both on the climate and the environmental fr front. So information, clear articulation of the strategy, areas of investment, um, and innovation that the private sector and the public sector can interface for the realization of the SDGs and for Vision 2030 overall as a strategy for, for national growth and development. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. Um, Nancy, any s specific challenges with respect to localizing the y You SDGs? know, I think um, Dr. Hughes is speaking from a, a, a private sector um, perspective, but he's perfectly correct in being able this commun information needs to be um, presented and it needs to be articulated. But what I think is critical is that this information is communicated in the language of the recipient um, and your private sector recipient and your modality would be through something as clear-cut and as structured as like say PPPs, that is, would be reasonably simple. It would actually be um, require some amount of sort of innovative design in the communication techniques used to ensure that you know a very the very important actors let's even just call them civil society or ordinary Jamaicans understand that these 17 goals are not abstract ideas that do not have no bearing on them or their day-to-day -day lives there must be some way of making them less abstract and real in the day-to-day -day. and obviously that would mean several different types of um, languages, so to speak, because you will have different audiences. Um, so I think it's, it, it is a huge task. But again, I found, like Dr. Hughes, that there was um, very little information amongst my member agencies, very little understanding of what the SDGs were, except they were vaguely associated with Vision 2030. And that was something that happened at um, the level of the Planning Institute and the GOG. So it, it okay. absolutely is critical. We're hearing you. Information and communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Malik, Mrs. Wellington. Yeah, I agree with both Dr. Hughes and Nancy. And as I alluded earlier, 
more sensitize, sensitization is in fact required. Mm -hmm. And at the local level for us, the major challenge is limited resources. Mm -hmm. it's, that's always a challenge. Remember, you know, we have our resources to do our everyday, day-to-day -day activities. Here we are tasked you now for the implementation of the SDGs. Let us mm -hmm. not fool ourselves. It mm -hmm. takes money to get it implemented. Mm -hmm. If it is that you are calling out stakeholders to a meeting, you have to provide the most times transportation for them to get to the venue if it is that you want for them to get there. And if you take them there, mm -hmm. you must provide some form mm -hmm. of refreshment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the major issues of matter of limited where we don't have a budgeted item that says this is for the implementation of the SDG. Whilst the municipal corporations, we stand ready and willing to do that. Also, we are constrained by capacity or technical support. We need technical support. Because, for example, in my office, I'm the director of planning for the planning department. I only have two other staff with me. So this task is no task with the planning department. I don't have the technical support in order to carry out this much needed function of having the implementation of the SDGs. So it's important that we address that, how is it that resources can be channeled to the local authorities so we can maximize the implementation of the SDGs because we stand ready mm. to carry, that, carry through that task. Okay, thank you. Noted. And Mr. Levy, any specific challenges with respect to really just encouraging the youth to participate? in the SDGs process? Well, as I mentioned earlier, youth stand ready to participate um, actively in the process of nation development. Um, many have forged their own channels to be able to do so um, because traditional channels sometimes are frustrated and uh, we've seen sometimes over the years um, a tokenistic approach taken to youth engagement just to say you have a youth at the table um, but you're not utilizing them to help execute so that's one of the challenges that young persons have, um, have raised over the years it is the tokenistic approach to youth engagement again we're not just passive participants um, we might be in experience in some sense but we are not lack of ideas of innovative tools and solutions to issues that arise um, and so meaningfully engaging young persons in a way that it is to help to elevate what they have to contribute and not just to say that you have a youth at the table outside of that aspect of things the communication is important um, you know oftentimes it is said that you know youths are you know kind of lackluster in terms of their approach to you know any civic or national um, issues um, but it's important to recognize that how it is that you sell the information is how it is that it will be received. Um, and so young persons operate at different levels, just as in you know, private sector and so forth, public sector. Um, and so you have to reach them where they are. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're communicating, you can utilize the requisite to traditional media, um, social media, etc., to communicate that. But that is just reducing it to a bite-sized chunk. How then can you pinpoint the areas that they can specifically work on. Um, and so it is identifying those areas and working with groups within the communities to help to execute um, projects and ideas around how best to you know, involve them in that particular process. Um, one such in terms of climate action is you know, we have in, um, international um, beach cleanup day and so locally we participate in that action of keeping the beaches clean. Um, however, there ought to be a through the year activity that involve young persons in terms of climate actions. You're talking about energy. How can we um, ensure that we build um, societies that are greener, right? Um, and it can start within government itself. So it, it, it might be a cost that, you know, they say it takes cash to care. Um, but in terms of, you know, you're getting new buses, we can go LNG, we can, you know, seek to do electric. Um, if it is that you're building new government ministries, department agencies, how best can you go green and how best can you turn existing facilities green? Um, so there are several things that we can do 
in terms of ensuring that and incorporating and embedding those ideas, starting first um, from early, early childhood, secondary, um, primary, to ensure that they are participating. Mm -hmm. right? One way to ensure that you know, a youngster ensure that they get a second language is to teach it to them from early. So it's not just to start it at a higher level, but start it from further down where they can um, see the importance of it and put it to them in a fashion that they can understand and want to meaningful participate in it. Mm, okay. Thank you. I do know that at the Planning Institute we are crafting a dissemination plan, mm -hmm. um, multidimensional, recognizing the need to be reaching communities, local organizations, civil society organizations, the private sector. Um, it is a challenge, as you have mentioned, Marlet, because of the resources that are required and um, we, we have to take that into consideration. But this is where we need to be creative. We need to be creative and we need to think about what's happening and how we can integrate um, you know, our communication yes, with what's happening and partnering. And so, which leads me to my next question. And um, just how do you think you can best partner with the government with respect to achieving the SDG goals, the, the groups that you represent. That government, civil society partnership, government, local, gov um, mm -hmm. local government. Um, I know, Dr. Hughes, you've mentioned the PPP approach and mm -hmm. Orville. That sort of partnership, how best can we, can we do that in, in reality? How, yeah. how can we... we um, well... In terms of mm -hmm. partnerships, um, mm -hmm. I think for the private sector, the critical thing would be to deal with the issue of availability of capital, um, access to capital, both for the, the traditional small, micro, um, medium-sized businesses, but also to look at <coughs> the kind of larger scale projects that you need to make a, a difference in terms of the transformation of the infrastructure of the country. Um, it has to be put in the framework of, a, of the development strategy. Um, I, I heard a comment, I think it was Dr. Henry, who made the, the point about the narrow base of our export. Um, yeah. um, Jamaica has to export more, but it also has to look at its vulnerability because of the narrow export base. And if you think about it, the, the fact is that we used to be an industrial, have more industries. There was a stronger industrial base. We had lots of um, industries. And we have scaled that back in a sense, in a relative sense, and built up tourism, which is a, services, um, a service industry. Um, and we don't, therefore, have the, sc the, um, the scope of export. Um, and that has to do with the transformation that has taken place over a fairly long period of time um, where we move from industrial policy to uh, a more um, private sector-led, market-driven resource allocation strategy. Um, so the articulation of the industrial strategy, the industrial base and how the economy is going to evolve, not just at the macro level, but at the sectoral level and where the, the private sector can see space for itself, for infrastructure, not just for foreign investors in toll roads and, and, and you know, large-scale projects, but the local private sector, how they can partner with the government. So access to capital is an, is an important area and the area in which you're going to invest. The second thing is how do you work with the regulatory banking, finance authorities about how you invest um, using your off balance sheet um, um, you know borrowing mm -hmm. facility. Mm -hmm. How do you articulate a view which says you can utilize financial engineering to, to get projects and access capital. Now, these are not things that are readily discussed um, at certain levels but they are very important in, in changing the discourse and the, the, the discussion to attract the private sector 
if you're not going to be attracting the private sector players for investment if all we talk about are the traditional poverty, gender um, issues, while those are very important, you're not going to attract the bankers and the and the the um, the, the finance people, the people with capital. Um, you know, there's a dis disconnect in the discourse. So I think we need to, in the communication, to find ways of partnering, to find a way for the planning institute to be at the uh, to be a presenter when the stock exchange uh, has its annual conference in January to speak to uh, how you integrate the capital market and the the, the finance um, people mm -hmm. in the development process for NG, for um, the, the the NGO. <laughs> Um, development goals rather um, mm -hmm. and the final thing is carrying the discussion forward about how you reduce risks um, the development financing how do you share the risk because that's part of the concern we are small we are vulnerable and um, people don't necessarily want to take all the risk how the partnership can be used to reduce the risk for private investors so the language has to change. The place and time of the discussion has to change if you're going to get these players to come on board. They're not going to come on board just to talk about the traditional things that development specialists and development economists like myself talk about. You have to bring the, the, the finance people, the finance engineers, so to speak, um, in the same room. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Very briefly, Nancy, partnership with the government. You know, um, I think, I think the SDGs have alluded to. Yeah, I right. have, but I just wanted to just kind of reiterate a bit about the point about the um, the difficulties. But there are opportunities, I think, in civil society that this structured approach to development under the SDGs, even Vision 2030 affords um, all of us. And CVSS you know, tries not to miss an opportunity to explain, um, to underscore how a civil society actor who is on the ground implementing a, a micro activity, helping them to understand how that builds up into one of the 17 goals. And therefore, use the language, use the structure that the, the government of Jamaica is presenting um, and therefore, you will always be speaking the same language of your partners in government or even overseas development agencies. Um, so this is this is an opportunity, I think, for civil society. And I think it's also a very structured approach to, again, coming back to data, who's doing what towards what mm -hmm. goal, to be able to really get a feel for what's going on the ground. We have 131 members. I believe there are 400-odd registered benevolence, charities, um, and NGOs across the island. And that's not capturing the other 501 Everybody. C3s that come into Jamaica and make a tremendous impact. And nobody could quantify mm -hmm. what they've done. We know they might have donated 10,000 mass or 10,000 US, mm -hmm. but what have they done towards these? Achieving the, achieving the goals. The goals. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important missing piece of information. And I think, therefore, you know, maybe GOG is not really appreciating that we actually might have made further progress than we realize. Perhaps. Perhaps, yes. yes. <laughs> Marley? Um, I would say for us, because we're a local government, mm -hmm. and um, we have, what, 17 goals? So we could look at the interagency network, because as a local authority, we are not responsible for all of these goals and mm -hmm. different and agencies of government, our ministries of government mm -hmm. are responsible. So if you put all these agencies is one in one room, of course, headed by the PIOJ, this is a way in which we can mm -hmm. get to achieve the, the SDGs because the different agencies come with different resources mm -hmm. that they can put on the table to mm -hmm. assist. At a recent workshop that I attended, and I found this very important, that it's something that Jamaica could adapt, the fact that um, in Helsinki, what they have done, they have put the SDGs in their school curriculum starting at the elementary level. And for us, we're looking at putting back civic in our 
Mm -hmm. school curriculum so we could integrate this um, SDGs in the school curriculum mm -hmm. so we start from the little ones from early so they carry it right through mm -hmm. the life and then they would have, would have the full buy-in because you know once the little ones grasp the SDG they share it among their friends and they take it home to their friends and families mm -hmm. okay thank you thanks for that Marlet and Orville um, okay. that is true. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy that you mentioned that because properly integrating um, the SDGs within the school curriculum mm -hmm. is one way um, to really, you know, from a youth perspective, gain their um, involvement, partnering with the key agencies. So CPFSA, when it comes on to child care and protection, because, you know, mm -hmm. they, 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 um, there are indicators within the SDGs that link towards um, the protection of young persons and children. Um, there is also um, ways in which we can uh, engage. So. Next month, we will be, again, Youth Month, we'll be having a youth forum. Um, we've already started some, you know, uh, informal dialogue with PIOG. And we would love to have, um, you know, engagement like those where young persons can be able to hear from, um, you know, the chief decision makers and planners around the SDGs and, you know, figure out other ways in which they can meaningfully participate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank I you. think we've run out of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> colleagues, this has really been very interesting. I am sure we are um, all agreed that the conversation has provided very useful insights and perspectives, and it's been very valuable. Um, some key takeaways. The, we, speak, we heard of the continued relevance of the SDGs, the fact that SDGs can in fact be a rallying call for, 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 for a population, the importance of data and, home, and monitoring, um, especially among civil society, civil society groups, the um, continued alignment of the local sustainable development plans with the, with the SDGs and the innovation of the voluntary local review that, that um, is being spearheaded by the Trelawney Municipal Corporation. We heard about the enthusiasm and continued interest of the youth in, in the SDGs, the importance of ensuring our dissemination plan that is being crafted is, is, is looking, is ensuring that we're dealing, we're, we're addressing the exchange of information, dissemination um, at various levels, um, the need for public-private partnerships as it is re relates to our, our partnership with the with, um, with our colleagues in the private sector, importance of innovative financing, access to capital, and we've also heard about um, the need for us to ensure that the SDGs become integrated in the school curriculum from the er at the earliest level. So colleagues, please join me in thanking our panelists for what I think was a very, very, very interesting panel discussion. Thank you all, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. Okay, thank you. Yes, yes. Colleagues, join me in giving our moderator and our panelists, as they make their way to their seats, another round of applause, please. There is definitely room for more players in the development arena to join the IDPs, private sector, civil society, private foundations, who are already doing the work in the field, ending poverty, ensuring good health and well-being, reducing inequalities, and preserving our one planet cannot wait. Accelerating our progress and achieving the goals require active and meaningful participation of all players or citizenry, especially our young people and other populations at risk of being left behind. We've heard today's call, and I'm trusting that we've also answered. Colleagues and friends, thank you for joining us today. We are at the end of what I think was a wonderful United Nations Day start and Jamaica's Diamond Jubilee 60th UND anniversary celebration. Thank you for sharing in this discussion of the localization of the SDGs and the lessons learned from Jamaica's voluntary national review. It is my pleasure on behalf of Dr. Gary Keneal and the UN country team to thank you all for being here today. 
Today would not have been possible without the kind support and input from the government of Jamaica through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade. We are particularly grateful to the Planning Institute of Jamaica, Dr. Wayne Henry, Barbara Scott and their teams, without whom today would not have been possible. To our panelists, partners, heads of international agencies, thank you for remaining with us. To the members of Jamaica's UN country team, the co-creators of today's event, thank you, thank you, thank you. Last, but by no means least, I thank the Secretary General and staff of the International Seabed Authority. We thank you for your warm and cooperative hospitality. To, th to those of you who've joined us online here at home in Jamaica and in the diaspora across the world, thank you as well. We're glad you came and started UN Day with us. We will continue to recognize UN Day and UN Jamaica's Partnership Week with our annual Partnership Forum on Thursday, October 24. Dr. Keneal spoke of that today. And the forum will be hosted by veteran broadcast journalist and actress, Jamaica's very own Faye Ellington. You're all invited on Thursday the 27th. You don't want to miss this activity as we aim to better equip ourselves with the tools, the networks, the partnerships needed to truly fuel Jamaica's sprint for the sustainable development goals. I am Jermaine McKenzie. It has been certainly a pleasure hosting you today. Good afternoon and walk good. Thank you.